Hello and welcome to the discussion. This channel is here to serve as a platform for thoughtful conversations about God, philosophy, religion, history, and more. My name is Nahoa, and I'm here to ask questions, to seek truth openly and critically, and to share the journey with you. Take a moment to think about what you know and how you know it. You might look around and know your surroundings as you watch or listen to this. You know you have thoughts and beliefs, don't you? Hopefully you know that five times itself is 25 and that injustice isn't good. Maybe you know that technology is rapidly advancing and that sound can't travel through the vacuum of space. You know that you exist, don't you? Do you know if I, on the other side of your screen, exist? How? How, how would you know that? Do you know if you're fully conscious right now or if this is all a dream? What do you know? What does it even mean to know something? That, that's an important question, and it's one of the main questions we'll discuss in this video. A scholar joining and teaching us today is an epistemologist, a kind of philosopher who focuses on exploring the natures of belief, justification, rationality, and knowledge. He studied at UC Berkeley and earned his doctorate at Rutgers University. He has published on political and ethical philosophy, but he's probably most renowned for his work in epistemology. Famously, at least in the field, he has defended phenomenal conservatism, something we'll get into soon enough. As I broaden the scope of my studies beyond just early Christian history, I want to deepen my understanding of, well, understanding itself. So that's why I've reached out to today's guest. Anyway, without further introduction, Dr. Michael Humer, how are you? I'm great. It's great to be here, and thanks for that generous introduction. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad to have you on. It's an honor, and I'm excited to ask you some questions. Uh, we'll get into a bunch of things, and I mentioned a few of them, but before we attempt to positively analyze knowledge, maybe we should start by talking about skepticism. Could you tell us about a couple different forms of skepticism and what might motivate a skeptic to affirm them? Yeah, I mean, the most popular form of skepticism is external world skepticism. This is the view that we cannot know any contingent propositions about the external world. Okay, so by the external world, I mean everything outside of your own mind, right? And by contingent propositions, I mean things that could be more than one way, could have been otherwise. All right, so these um, external world skeptics would say, um, you know, you don't, you don't know whether I exist. I don't know whether you exist, right? You don't know anything about the physical world. You know, don't even know if you have a hand because, you know, that's external to my mind. Um, and, uh, but, you know, they would not deny that you know that two plus two is four. Okay, so, um, because that's an example of a necessary truth instead of a contingent truth. Um, and then, you know, and then, you know, some skeptics are more extreme. So what we call global skepticism is the view that you can't know any propositions whatsoever. Right. So, you know, not even not even skepticism itself. OK, so according to the global skeptics, you don't even know if you exist. All right. And so, you know, why would why would anybody think these things? Um, I guess like the most common argument for global skepticism is the regress argument. This is where people say, well, in order to know anything, you have to have a reason for believing it. But, um, you know, and then, you know, the reason has to also be something that, you know, so then there has to be a reason for the reason. And then that just goes on forever. Right. And so, um, OK, you can't complete the regress, so you can never justify anything. Uh, and then, you know, probably the most famous argument for external world skepticism is uh, something like the brain in the vat. Right. Where, you know, they just come up with scenarios for how everything could seem the way that it currently does. But your beliefs about the external world could be radically mistaken. Right. So, you know, the brain in the vat scenario is um, scientists have um, they put this brain in a vat and they have little wires attached to it so they can feed it electrical stimulation and they can stimulate the brain in exactly the pattern that a normal brain would be stimulated while interacting with the real world. <laughs> right. And so, you know, they could create this kind of virtual reality um, simulation, right? And, you know, maybe they would create a simulation of um, listening to a podcast where somebody's talking about a brain in a vat, you know, so how do you know that you're not a brain in a vat? And if you say, well, I just, I just know, I can see the podcast right here and I can see my own hand. And, but on the brain in a vat hypothesis, 
that's all expected because they would be creating a very realistic simulation, right? Yeah, yeah, you're supposed to imagine, you know, they've got this amazing, uh, amazing computer program to simulate everything that you would experience in normal life. So anything that you do to try to refute the brain in a bat scenario, like uh, any evidence that you try to collect, you know, the skeptic will say, well, that could be just part of the simulation, you know, that uh, they maybe they were just trying to make you think that you're not a brain in a bat. So, you know, they programmed it, programmed in an experience of you reading about how brains and bats are not really feasible. Uh, right. You try you try to look up the brain science and, you know, but it turns out that they just put that into the simulation and actually brain science is much more advanced in the real world and whatever. Now, there have been a lot of other responses to skepticism, such as contextualism and semantic externalism, and they deal with the use of the word no, like, like to know, K-N-O-W, in different contexts. And while you say there's some value in these attempts, you emphasize a different argument focusing on unfalsifiability. So could you maybe explain unfalsifiability and how it shows that the brain in Nevada hypothesis is a worse hypothesis than the idea that we're just in the real world? Yeah, yeah. Well, so, you know, like what I was just saying about why you can't refute the brain of that scenario is also something that's wrong with it, right? <laughs> that is that the fact that any evidence that you come up with um, the, the skeptic can just, you know, say that they can explain that in exactly the same way, right? Whatever evidence you see, they could say, well, that was just programmed into the simulation. Okay. Um, so that makes it unfalsifiable. And in philosophy of science, it's standardly taken that unfalsifiable theories are bad, right? Okay. Now, not everybody understands why unfalsifiable theories are bad. And, you know, on the face of it, you might think, oh, well, so what? So it can't be proven false, but you know, so what? It doesn't, that certainly doesn't mean that it's false. Right? Um, okay, and you know, what's really wrong with unfalsifiable theories is that they're also unsupportable, right? And this comes out of a theorem of probability, right? So basically it's a theorem of probability that if E lowers the probability of H, then not E raises the probability of H and vice versa. So um, if something counts as evidence against a theory, then the opposite counts as evidence for the theory, you know, just in terms of raising and lowering probability. Okay, so a theory uh, for which you cannot have evidence against it is also a theory for which you cannot have evidence for it. And that means that you do not have any evidence for it. Okay, now, so that doesn't show that it's false, but alternative theories that are falsifiable can have evidence for them. Right. And so my claim is, you know, if you have competing theories like the brain of the bat scenario versus the real world scenario, right, which is, you know, the scenario that you're perceiving the real world normally, um, the real world scenario is not unfalsifiable. And um, so it is testable and it therefore can have evidence in its favor. And the brain of the bat scenario cannot have evidence in its favor. OK, mm -hmm. now. Um, right. So now, you know, why do I say the real world scenario is falsifiable? Um, well, the real world scenario implies that you should have experiences that are roughly coherent. That is, um, they, they make sense and they fit together. They can be interpreted as perceptions of real objects satisfying the laws of nature or something like that. Okay. And that's not true of all possible experiences. And as a matter of fact, I claim that's true of only a minuscule fraction, right? Close to 0% of experiences are coherent. Meaning if you just like had a random sequence of possible sensory experiences, it wouldn't, it wouldn't look like anything. It wouldn't be interpretable as representing any real objects. Okay. Now, so uh, if there are scientists who are stimulating a brain, um, they could stimulate it to have any possible sequence of experiences. Okay. So just from that, you know, it, um, so they could stimulate it to have coherent experiences, but they could also stimulate it to have incoherent experiences. So, Okay. Um, but if you're perceiving the real world, then it has to be coherent experiences. So there's a determinate prediction, which is in fact satisfied by your actual experiences, right? Okay. And so, you know, your actual experiences count as evidence in favor of the real world scenario, right? And I claim they count as extremely strong evidence, actually, because um, the prediction is an extremely specific prediction. Hmm. Right. It doesn't, it doesn't sound that specific when I just say you should have coherent experiences, but the out of the range of all possible experiences, the set of coherent experiences is the minuscule fraction 
So it's a highly specific prediction which comes true. So the theory is strongly supported. Hmm. So the fact that we have generally coherent, a, a generally coherent sequence of experiences is strongly predicted by the real world hypothesis because on that hypothesis, we're just interacting with, with reality as it is. Um, while on the brain in a vat hypothesis, the scientists could, as it were, like experiment with the setting. So they could randomly change the color of grass or adjust any of the psychophysical laws so that if two things collide, you have a random visual experience or things like that. And so if it was an experiment or a simulation or a brain in a vat hypothesis, then you wouldn't expect a generally coherent sequence of experiences. That's what you're arguing, right? Yes, right. Yeah, and I mean, you know, you, you imagine different things that the scientists could have done. Like most of the things that you imagine are alternative coherent experiences, but they could have just programmed completely incoherent experiences. That's I mean, true. they could have just, they could have the computer just stimulating your brain completely randomly. So you just have like, you know, random, <laughs> random colors in your visual field with random sounds, right? And by the way, random sounds sound like static, right? <laughs> And um, random colors um, look like, you know, what we used to call static on a television screen, but nobody sees television screens anymore. So, um, but you know, if you if you tune if you tune a television to um, a frequency where there was nothing being broadcast, you would see a pattern that looked like you know random black and white. Okay, but you know, um, it could be random different colors, and it just doesn't look like anything. Okay. And, you know, if you're, if you're doing that, you know, you could be producing random images for a million years and never see one that looks like anything, right? They, did, they would just all look like static. Now, a skeptic could, in principle, posit that the scientists who are stimulating the brain in a vat actually designed the stimulation or the experiment such that we do have coherent experiences. And so they're not constantly toying with the settings of the experiment, I guess. But I assume you'd respond to that by saying that's just an auxiliary hypothesis that adds complexity to to the essential argument? Or how, how would you respond to that? Yeah, I mean, you know, it is kind of ad hoc, right? Like, okay, so they, that is the fundamental explanation of the source of your experiences is um, your brain of that and some, something is directly stimulating parts of your brain. Okay, and then they have to add in stipulations about the scientists and their motives and their capabilities in order to explain your sequence of experiences. Okay, but also like, well, um, there are many possible um, sets of motivations and capabilities of the set of scientists that would have led to um, different experiences. All right, so um, like, you know, even if you assume that the scientists wanted to create a simulation of real life, um, the overwhelming majority of simulations do not look exactly like the real thing, right? So like, you know, if you, you try to program a computer simulation, you know, like when you play games, they don't in fact look exactly like real life, right? And, you know, periodically there are glitches in the program, right? And so on. So like the overwhelming majority of the space of possibilities would have things not look exactly like they currently do right mm -hmm. and then you know you think about what their motivations could be well you basically have to stimulate some uh you have to stipulate some bizarre motivation like um they want to make it look just like you live a perfectly ordinary life in the early 21st century for no particular reason right so right so, you know because like if you have any other motivation than it predicts that you would have experiences that would satisfy that, right? Like if the scientists were trying to, you know, maybe they were trying to give you a happy life, well, then your life should be a lot happier than it is, right? Well, maybe they were trying to, they were trying to study whatever human psychology. So then you should have like the most psychologically interesting life, right? Which is, I assume, isn't the case, right? Or, you know, like maybe these are like uh, religious scientists and they're trying to uh, inculcate moral virtue in the brain. Okay, well, then you should have experiences that are geared towards, you know, maximizing your virtue. Is that okay? So like, I assume for most people, their experiences don't look like they're geared towards any particular purpose. And so like, 
Yeah. So like, how do you explain the scientist's motivation? You just have some bizarre motivation. Like they're trying to make it look like they're not programming it, but like they're not pursuing any purpose. Right. Now, re related to this, I, those are some good points. And I think they'll, they'll carry over to what I'm about to ask you. Um, an interesting skeptical scenario is actually affirmed or at least entertained by Elon Musk. So he's, he says something to the effect of this, given the rapid technological progress of the last 50 years from the game Pong to, I mean, efficient artificial intelligence. In a thousand years, we will very likely have created simulations so realistic that even the people within the simulations think it's all real. But then who's to say that hasn't already happened? We could easily be in a futuristic <coughs> simulation, almost like Matrix style, and think incorrectly that our world is real. Or, or that's what Elon Musk says anyway. So yeah. you're an epistemologist, you study knowledge, and we've just been talking about skeptical scenarios, and such as the brain in the vat hypothesis. And I think they're very similar because they involve scientists kind of creating yeah, this yeah. virtual world. So how would you respond to that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, that, by the way, comes from Nick Bostrom, the philosopher. Mm. And uh, so, you know, Bostrom says, well, like, at some time in the future, computing power will be so cheap that the overwhelming majority of beings to have ever lived will be simulated. <laughs> They'll be computer simulated beings, not um, flesh and blood beings. Okay. And so then you're supposed to think, oh, so then I'm probably a simulated being. Okay. But, um, but Bostrom only says that he thinks there's like a 20% chance that we're living in a simulation. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, which I think is uh, much too high. And then, but then Elon Musk comes and says, Oh no, there's like the odds are billions to one in favor of our being in a simulation, which just sounds completely insane. You know, like, uh, like the sort of thing that a schizophrenic would think, but he's not schizophrenic. <laughs> um, anyway, and also, um, I'm not sure that the people who say this, in fact, believe it. I think that they believe that they believe it, but they don't because, um, you know, try writing to Elon Musk or, you know, well, he won't respond to you, but try writing to Nick Bostrom and telling him that you've seen some glitches in the matrix, right? And then like, to, you know, try to describe some, something that happened to you in your life that could be explained by a glitch in the matrix. And what, what do you think he's going to say? You think he's going to say, oh, wow, that's good evidence that we're in a simulation. No, he's going to say, go talk to a psychiatrist. Right. Because, you know, like, you know, the people who give this argument never actually think that they've seen a, a glitch in the matrix. Right. But OK. But anyway, yeah. So the, the simulation hypothesis is like the brain in a vat scenario. It's also unfalsifiable, uh, but it also has like additional assumptions that the brain in the vat scenario doesn't have. So it has the assumption that um, computer simulations can think. Right, like that, that is, if you have a computer simulated person, then that there is actually a consciousness that experiences the things that the computer simulated person is supposed to experience, right? Um, and I have near zero credence in that. Okay, but so, you know, like, so the simulation hypothesis is like the brain vat scenario, but worse, because it also requires controversial philosophical assumptions about consciousness. Hmm. And I mean, this isn't an interview on the philosophy of mind, but if we're talking about consciousness, how would you understand consciousness? Because a lot of people just, they'll say environmental awareness and then maybe self-awareness, like a sense of identity. Um, is that generally how you define it? Oh, uh, well, I didn't mean self-consciousness, although self-consciousness is also interesting. But yeah, I meant... Um, You're talking you about have... qualia? Yeah, you have experiences with a particular qualitative character. It feels a certain way to be you, right? And, you know, like as, as Tom Nagel says, um, the fact that an organism is conscious means that there is something it is like to be that organism. Right. In a way that like there's nothing that it's like to be a rock, but there is something that it's like to be a bat. Hmm. That makes sense. Um, and you mentioned earlier the infinite regress argument. So skeptics will try to question how any belief can be grounded. And they'll say, if you believe something, there should be a reason for that belief. But if you believe that reason, there should be a reason for that, and so on ad infinitum. But there can't be an infinite regress of, of reasons. So no, none of your beliefs are actually reasonable. 
And that's a popular skeptical argument, but you and many, probably most philosophers, would respond by appealing to foundationalism. So what is foundationalism, and how does it help us to understand our web of beliefs? Yeah, yeah. Foundationalism is the dominant view in the history of philosophy, um, and also the correct view. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, you know, roughly speaking, foundationalists think there are some things that we know that we don't need reasons for, or some things that you're justified in believing, and you don't require reasons, meaning you don't require other beliefs to support it in order for it to be justified. Uh, and everything else that you're justified in believing is based upon those things, which are known as the foundations or the foundational beliefs. All right. So, um, you know, what would be a foundational belief? Like, well, um, almost all foundationalists accept beliefs about your present conscious mental state. So, um, you like, uh, if you're in pain, then you just know immediately that you're in pain. You don't need a reason for thinking you're in pain, right? Other than the pain itself. Um, in one of your or, books. Uh, Sorry, if I, if I can jump in for the audience. If in one of your books, you give a helpful like thought experiment where you say, let's say you go to the doctor and you say, I think I have arthritis. They ask, why do you think that? And that's a natural question to ask. Um, you, you, know, you have a reason for that belief. And so you say, well, I feel pain. And if they ask, why do you think you feel pain? I mean, how, how are you supposed to respond to that? There's not a, a reason you know that you feel pain. It's just kind of a direct awareness of it. Yeah. But, you know, like, what would you say if the doctor asked you why you think you're in pain? Uh, maybe you would assume that he was joking or you'd assume that he misheard you or something. <laughs> and maybe you just like repeat yourself. Look, I'm in pain. OK, <laughs> just quit <laughs> fucking around. <laughs> just, you know, just help me. Um, but, you know, you probably wouldn't tr start trying to give arguments that you're in pain. Like, um, and how would the argument go? Right. <laughs> Um, anyway, and so, you know, like, um, one of the most common things that people say, you know, after people hear about global skepticism, like one of the first things that um, every undergraduate class thinks of is that it's self-defeating, right? So, you know, you could also ask the global skeptic, well, why they believe, you know, why do you believe skepticism? And then they give you this argument. The argument starts with, well, in order for belief to be justified, you have to have a reason for it. And you go, okay, well, what's your reason for that? <laughs> and they can't say that's self-evident because the premise itself says that nothing is self-evident, right? So they got to give a reason for that. <laughs> then they, okay. And I don't know. And I've never heard somebody give a reason for that. But if they do give a reason for it, I'll just ask for the reason for that. Right? Um, so anyway. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. But so, you know, foundationalism, what things are foundational, like beliefs about your present conscious mental states are generally taken to be foundational and also some simple necessary truths. So, you know, how do I know that A equals A? I mean, I'm not going to give an argument that A equals A, okay? It's just if you understand what that means, then you know that that has to be true, right? If you understand the, um, the equals, what equals means, <laughs> right? then, you know, everything equals itself. Yeah, so uh, present mental states, and also just I exist, right? Like Descartes was a very famous yeah. foundationalist, and not just a foundationalist, but he began by questioning everything, and then he thought, okay, I don't need, I, as the kind of foundation of all my other beliefs, I can think I exist. Because if I deny that, then, you know, just who's denying it? Um, so uh, yeah. beliefs about yeah, your own present state, your, oh yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, you know, as philosophers like to explain it, um, well, you couldn't be mistaken about the fact that you exist because, you know, um, if, if you're mistaken about anything, you have to exist. In order for there to be a mistake, there has to be somebody who's committing the mistake. So, <laughs> right. Um, yeah, right. And so, you know, Descartes thought, oh, this is a good foundation because it's impossible to have reasons for doubting it. Right. Now, that isn't, uh, that isn't really my view. Right. So, hmm. yeah, so Descartes' view is the things that are foundational are the things that you couldn't have reasons for doubting. But I think that's a, um, so that's an interesting feature of the belief that you exist, but that's, I think that's different from um, the feature of being foundational. I think the things that are foundational are just, um, you know, whatever seems to you to be the case, right? So um, that is, in other words, I think the rational starting point for anyone is, 
Um, just let's start by assuming that things are the way they appear, unless we have reasons for thinking otherwise. Right. Okay. So this is a revisable foundation, right? That is, it's a starting point. It's not necessarily the ending point. So um, if you do get reasons for thinking things are not the way they appear, then you can revise that. But until you have reasons for revising it, then, you know, it makes sense to just assume that everything is the way it seems. And you just described phenomenal conservatism, which yeah. I think if you technically phrase it, it's in the absence of defeaters, um, P, uh, some person P is justified in believing some proposition. No, some person S is justified in believing some proposition P if it seems to S as though P, right? And so uh, you have the defeasibility condition, but understanding justification involves understanding appearances and seemings, right? Yeah, yeah. And so... Yeah, so... Oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah, I mean, uh, so, you know, like, there's there are different kinds of appearances that we have, right? So that, this principle about, you know, assuming that things are the way they appear, this explains the justification of all of the beliefs that we normally think of as justified. So, you know, like, why do I... Um, why do I get to believe that there's a desk in front of me? Well, okay, I have a visual experience of a desk, which is a kind of appearance, it's a visual appearance, right? And I don't have any reason for doubting it, so it makes sense for me to assume that there's a desk here. Okay, but it also works for more abstract things, like um, why do I think that murder is wrong? Well, it seems wrong to me, and I don't have any reason for doubting that. So it makes sense for me to assume that it is wrong until somebody gives me a good argument to the contrary, right? And so, you know, so, you know, it works for our moral beliefs and beliefs about your immediate environment that you, you know, things that you observe with your senses. Uh, it works for memory, um, works for introspection, you know, works for uh, mathematical beliefs. And, you know, basi basically, you know, I think it's the foundation of all justified beliefs. And you say that if it seems to you as though P, then that the default is basically to assume you're justified in affirming P unless you have a defeater. One of my friends who is familiar with your work was wondering why we should think our seemings are by default truth tracking. And if the answer is that they, they seem to be aimed at truth, then wouldn't that be circular justification? Yeah. Um, well, so, you know, there's, a, there's an issue here about what they call epistemic circularity or something like this. But, you know, suppose that we had a theory of justification and let's just stipulate that this is some time in the future when epistemologists have discovered the correct comprehensive theory of justification. So this is a theory that tells you under all, circum all possible circumstances, whether a belief is justified or unjustified, okay? And I'm stipulating that it's the correct theory, okay? And so let's say this theory says you're justified in believing P if um, your belief has feature F, whatever feature F is, <laughs> okay? So I haven't assumed anything substantive except that there's such a thing as justification, right? <laughs> um, okay, and then, so suppose somebody says, um, okay, so why are you justified in believing that theory? And what could the epistemologist possibly say? Uh, there's two options. Either he says, because this theory has feature F, or he says anything else. Okay, if he says anything else, then uh, he's contradicting himself, right? So if he, says the, right, the, if he says the theory is justified because it has some feature other than feature F, then he's admitting that his theory isn't the correct account of justification. Okay, so he has to say because it has feature F. Okay, and now you, you imagine somebody saying, oh, well, so this is a circular explanation. <laughs> or it's like, you know, the theory which says that feature F confers justification is justified because it has feature F. Um, so is that objectionable? Well, remember that I stipulated that this was the correct theory. Okay, and so like what would happen to the correct theory um, it, like it can't be an objection to a theory that it has a feature that would necessarily be had by the correct theory if we had one, right? So my claim is it's not it's not an objection to phenomenal conservatism that you know like the way that it's justified is based on appearances, right? And, you know why should we think that um, appearances are likely to be true? I don't know because it just seems that way, right? Okay, now 
right now, in fact, in my published articles, like that wasn't all that I said. I didn't just say phenomenal conservatism seems right, right. to me. <laughs> uh, I, I gave arguments for it. These arguments themselves appeal to other things that seem true to me, but that's true of every argument whatsoever, right? That anyone gives for any theory, whether it be phenomenal conservatism or some other theory, it's true that their argument rests on things that seem true to them. Okay. So, you know, mine just has the virtue that it's um, internally coherent, right? And, you know, and, and alternative theories, um, they also rely on the way things seem to you. But if they come to the conclusion that the way things seem to you isn't what justifies beliefs, then they're just incoherent. Hmm. Now, that wasn't all just preliminary stuff, but it was preparing us to discuss knowledge itself. And I was actually introduced to epistemology through Dr. Alvin Planning's work on the philosophy of religion. And he, of course, defended proper functionalism, which you think falls prey to counterexamples. Um, so we can talk about that. But in contrast to him, you understand knowledge as justified, true belief in the absence of defeaters. So knowledge, you, know, you, you believe it, of course, and it has to be true. You can't know something if it's false. It's justified, and you have the, defeat, the defeasibility condition. So you've said this is, quote, the most sophisticated and most nearly adequate analysis of knowledge. So could you maybe break each of those elements down and explain why you think this is basically the best way to understand knowledge? Yeah. And, you know, like, um, I mean, as you said, I, I said that it was nearly adequate, right? Right. Um, because there's no... There's no analysis that anyone has discovered that um, covers all cases. So as far as I know, there are counterexamples to every analysis that everyone has discovered, including this one. But this one comes closest in the sense that the counterexamples are the weirdest, right? Or they're like the most unusual kinds of cases that you know have to get kind of complicated to see. Um, but yeah, okay. So, um, uh, so knowledge requires belief. And now um, some people say... You know, occasionally somebody says, oh, when you know something, you don't believe it. You know, you have something stronger than believing it. But I just want to say, well, the way that um, philosophers use the word belief, you know, it includes being completely convinced of things, right? Includes being certain of something or whatever. So, um, and, you know, like, why do we think it has to be true? Um, you know, occasionally somebody says, some like undergraduate students talk about knowing things that are not true. Like they say, Back in the Middle Ages, everyone knew that the Earth, uh, or everyone knew that the Sun orbited the Earth. Right? <laughs> they'll, say, they'll say something like that. Basically, my explanation is this is like an inverted commas use of no. Right? What they mean is everyone quote knew unquote. Right? Meaning, in other words, people at the time would have described themselves as knowing. They would have used the word no, but they didn't in fact know that because that wasn't the case. Right. Uh, you know, a short argument for the truth condition is um, if if you know that P, then you have to know whether P. And if you know whether something is the case, then you have to have the correct belief about it. Right. So, um, you know, if if John knows that the test is at nine o'clock, then he knows when the test is. If he knows when the test is, he's got to be right about it. OK, anyway. All right. Uh, what about the justification condition? Um, you know, it's usually said that this. Um, well, the justification and no defeaters together eliminate the possibility of just making a lucky guess, mm. right? So you have the case where, like, um, um, you know, you you go to you go to Las Vegas to gamble, and you know, like, you're <laughs> putting money down at the roulette wheel, and you say, like, okay, it's gonna it's gonna come down on twenty seven. I just know it, and then because <laughs> I just have a good feeling about this, right? And so you bet money on it, and then just as chance would have it, it comes up 27, okay. And then, you know, what you're supposed to think, what most people think is, okay, well, the person didn't actually know. They just made a lucky guess, okay. And by the way, I'm stipulating that the person in the example does not have psychic powers, right? So, <laughs> okay, so there are no psychic powers, okay. But uh, even so, the scenario is perfectly possible. It's just unlikely, but the person could get lucky. And you want to say, well, they didn't really know. Okay. Um, and then uh, why do we need the no defeaters condition? Uh, there are examples like, um, this comes from Bertrand Russell, like you look at a stopped clock 
and the clock says three o'clock, you know, unbeknownst to you, the clock is stopped. Okay. So you believe that it's three o'clock and as chance would have it, it is actually three o'clock. So, right. Cause even a stopped clock is right twice a day. So do you know the time in this example? Right. And most people say, so no, that doesn't count as knowledge. Um, and you know, in some sense it was a lucky guess, but notice that it's a justified true belief, right? So, you know, person looking at the clock, he has the right time. He believes it's three o'clock. It is three o'clock and he's got pretty good justification because that's how you normally find out the time by looking at clocks, right? So, okay. Justified true belief, but not knowledge. So you add this other condition that there should be no defeaters where a defeater is, um, a true proposition such that if it was added to your beliefs, it would result in you no longer being justified in believing the thing that we're talking about. Okay. So in this case, the defeater would be the clock is stopped. So if you add that to your beliefs, then you're no longer justified in believing that it's three o'clock. Right. So it's true in, in the example, it's true that the clock is stopped. And if you add that to your beliefs, you're not justified in believing that it's actually three o'clock. So it's a mm. defeater. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, you know, that, that does pretty good for, you know, explaining what knowledge is. I've heard a saying maybe from Dr. Tyler McNabb that luck kills knowledge. So the more luck you sprinkle on a belief, the less likely it is to count as knowledge. Um, the stop clock experiment is an example of that. So in light of this, can <laughs> phenomenal conservatives deal with luck and knowledge by saying coincidence itself counts as a defeater? Like, does, does that even make sense to say? Oh, um, well, so yeah, so it's why they agreed that, um, you know, luck is incompatible with knowledge. That is, you don't know something if you're right just by luck. Um, now, so you might think, oh, you know, is that itself just an analysis of knowledge? Well, no, because philosophers want to know what it means that it's lucky, right? So if you got it right, despite not having any reason to believe that you were right, then, you know, you, that was just luck. Uh, and so, you know, the justification plus no defeaters is supposed to explain what it means to be right, not just by chance. Um, and then I guess I have to say, annoyingly, there are two slightly different uses of the word defeater in epistemology, right? One is the one that I just said, it's a true proposition that if added to your beliefs would result in you no longer being justified in believing the thing that you believe. Um, the other thing, the other use of defeater is it's a reason for doubt that you yourself have. Okay, so when I say, um, you know, in explaining phenomenal conservatism, I say, well, if it appears to you that P and you don't have any defeaters, then you're justified in believing P. By defeaters there, I just mean reasons for doubt that you would have. So if you don't have in your possession any reasons for doubt, then you're justified in believing things are the way they appear. Uh, okay, so now I'm not sure if I answered your question or not. No, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, another thing I was curious about is a lot of things we say we know are really things other people have told us and that we just ended up believing. Um, maybe because we're close to them or maybe in a sense it's justified because they've established themselves as reliable or knowledgeable and so on. Um, but they're not directly based on our own seeming. It's not like we perceive what they're saying or we remember it or we reflect inwardly, you know, introspection. So it, it's almost as if we derive knowledge from others. Uh, how, how should we understand the value of testimony in epistemology? Yeah, I mean, my claim is going to be that that's also explained by appearances. All right. So, um, yeah, so somebody told you something, uh, you know, like actually the great majority of knowledge that I have about the great majority of general knowledge that I have about the world comes from testimony. And I put it that way because, you know, like my knowledge about my immediate surroundings obviously comes from perception. And that's a that's a large amount of information. <laughs> but uh, when I have knowledge like, you know, I know that Napoleon was defeated in 1815 or something. Um, OK, that came from other people. And, you know, there are eight plants in the solar system also came from other people. OK, just like almost everything about the world just comes from other people. Um, but that also is from appearances because like, well, how did I know that the other people were saying those things? Well, I had to have sensory appearances. I had to have an experience of seeming to hear them say those things. Right. And then, you know, sometimes like I have a sense of whether the person seems credible or not. Like, you know, 
do they does it does it seem like they're lying or does it seem like they're being sincere right now that being said like a lot of people have more trust than they should have in other people so like you know you believe a lot of stuff that other people tell you when the other people actually don't know what they're talking about right so um you know okay so you know mo most religious beliefs um people have just because they got it from their parents and the way that you can tell that this isn't very reliable is that there are multiple different religions that conflict with each other. And so the, the reason why most people have their, you know, like most people, if they had been born in a different family, they would have a different religion. So, so it seems that it's not reliable. So that's a defeater at least. Right. Um, you know, you know, like you might wonder if, the, if people are just, uh, if they are at least prima facie justified in believing what other people told them and like, I'm not sure about that. I think you need some reason for thinking that the other people are reliable. Hmm. Right? Like you don't need a reason for thinking that your own faculties are reliable. You get to start by using your own natural faculties. But when somebody else tells you something which is based upon some experience that they had, right? Or it might be they got it from another person, but if, you know, it's got to trace back to somebody who originally acquired it without testimony. Um, so it's based on somebody else's experience. And I think you don't get to just immediately assume that other people's experiences are reliable. You have to have a reason for thinking that other people are reliable, which would come from your own experiences. You know, everything you know comes from your own experiences. So like the reason why I think other people are reliable about the physical world is that the things that they say generally match the things that I perceive. So I think other people have a reliable faculty of vision because when I see stuff, other people also see that stuff. Right. And I, and, you know, if I was seeing totally different stuff and, uh, you know, other people were not seeing the things I was seeing, I would probably think other people were unreliable. Hmm. That makes sense. Um, and I'm trying to wrap my head around the idea of someone believing contrary to their seemings. Well, what would be an example of, of a case where it seems to S as though P, but they choose I mean, can can you choose not to believe something uh, against appearances? Um, so I think yes. Um, so these are cases of like self-deception um, or uh, so, um, you know, some people describe appearances as inclinations to believe something. I think that's too broad. Mm -hmm. Appearances are just one kind of inclination to believe something. You can also be inclined to believe things not because they seem true, but because say you want them to be true. Or you could be inclined to believe something because you think that it's what you're supposed to believe. Like you could get social pressure to believe something, or you could believe that a virtuous person would believe this proposition. So that's why you want to believe it. Okay, so wanting to believe something is a different kind of inclination from appearance, right? Um, it is possible to believe what doesn't appear to be true um, okay, so, uh, you know, like your child has been accused of a crime and you just don't want to believe that he's guilty, mm -hmm. but there's like all this evidence that makes it really look like he's guilty, <laughs> but you sort of like talk yourself into ignoring the evidence, right? So that's a case of not believing what seems true. All right, that makes sense. And I was also wondering if epistemologists draw a distinction between justification and rationality. Because in ordinary language, they're generally synonymous. Um, but it seems that in principle, they could be different. And that knowledge could require both uh, undefeated seemings and rational belief-forming methods. And so maybe they should both be considered necessary for knowledge. But then I don't know if that's redundant. Because I, I, don't, I don't think it makes sense to say there are irrational seemings. Oh, yeah. Um... Wait, does say more about what you mean about the difference between rationality and justification? I was just wondering if that is a distinction that, that epistemologists draw, or if in the literature they're generally synonymous. Yeah, so I mean, I treat them as being the same. Hmm. Um, like what, what you're justified in believing is what it is rational to believe. Um, now, you know, there are these externalists who have, um, sometimes they have weird accounts of justification, right? Where you know, like Alvin Goldman says, well, a justified belief is just a belief that was formed by a reliable mechanism. And 
note that he does not mean a mechanism that you are justified in believing is reliable. He means a mechanism that is in fact reliable, regardless of whether you know that. Okay, so if there's a belief forming mechanism that's reliable, although you have no reason to think that it is, then, you know, when you form beliefs that way, they're justified. Okay, and I just think that that's a misuse of the word justify. Okay, but if you use the word justified in that way, then I would say, oh, well, then you have to distinguish justified from rational. Um, so, you know, like the rational thing, you know, usually people say, the, oh, what's rational to believe is what you have good reason to believe. And, you know, that description, unfortunately, leaves out foundational beliefs. So what's yeah. rational to believe is what is either foundationally justified or is supported by good arguments or something from the foundationally justified beliefs. Now, about the implications of what we've been talking about, phenomenal conservatism, foundationalism, knowledge, are there any areas in the philosophy of religion specifically that you think need major epistemological revisions? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I think people in philosophy of religion are, um, like they're already talking about the things that I would talk about. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, like you mentioned Alvin Plantinga earlier, I basically think Plantinga's whole philosophy is geared towards rationalizing Christianity. Right. And I, actually, I don't think this is a controversial opinion by me. I think everybody has noticed this. And so, and what's wrong with that? Maybe, you know, maybe Christianity is true. Uh, yes. Well, but I don't think that, um, I don't think his philosophy would persuade anyone who wasn't already a Christian and looking for a way to rationalize it. Right. And I, uh, like, I think my epistemology doesn't come off that way at all. Right. Like my epistemology arises from just thinking about the subject and, you know, like anybody of any religious belief or no religious belief could see, could see the point. Um, but by the way, like, um, it turns out accidentally that many Christians like my epistemological views and, and much of the rest of my philosophical views too. I didn't plan it that way. I'm not a Christian, but you know, it turned out that way. It turned out that way largely because, um, I'm, um, I'm not taken over by the fads, like the intellectual fads of the current day, you know, like, and the, the Christians also are not taken over by them because they have their own alternative philosophy, right? I'm not taken over by them because I just don't care what other people think, right? But anyway, so that's how we wound, we wind up converging on things that are sort of common sense that the, you know, current ideology rejects. But anyway, this is a bit of a digression. No, yeah, um, no, that's helpful though, because I, I think I know a lot of religious, um, <laughs> religious people like phenomenal conservatism for another reason, and that's because if seemings are what uh, define justification, then that would justify a lot of religious experiences. Because in a religious experience, it could, it often does seem to the person as if they're one with God or close to God, or God is speaking to them and things like that. And on your view. Um, that you, you, you wouldn't discount that immediately. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So like, I, I personally have not had a religious experience as far as I know, I don't, I don't really know what these experiences are like. Um, but you know, but I've read people's descriptions of them. Um, uh, but if I had such an experience, I assume that I would believe its content or I, I would at least be inclined to believe its content. Right. And, and I don't think that would be irrational. Right. And that, so. If you have an experience where, you know, like sometimes people say it feels like they're in contact with God, you know, there are different varieties. Like sometimes people actually feel like God is literally talking to them, like they could hear his voice. But other times there's just a more general sense of they're just aware of his presence. Um, and then, you know, there are vaguer experiences, you're just sort of like aware of whatever the greatness of the universe or something. And uh, so those are all, those experiences are reasons on the face of it to believe you know, believe those things, right? To believe that there is a God or that he's talking to you or whatever. Uh, but, you know, I do think that there are some uh, reasons for doubt about this. The main reason for doubt is that um, people from different cultures have different experiences. And frequently, um, they think that their religious experience supports a specific religion. But, right. you know, but the people around the world don't agree on which religion. 
And so it really looks as though the religion that you are brought up in or that is practiced in your culture has a huge influence on the content of your religious experiences. Hmm. Uh, neither of us would immediately discount a religious experience, but one another consideration that I think I've heard from Joe Schmidt is that um, there are positively atheistic experiences where someone might have an overwhelming sense of the indifference of the universe or they might have uh, an appearance of kind of God ruling out gratuitous evil, as in gratuitous evil that makes the existence of God seem um, very unlikely. And that's that's another thing that you also wouldn't want to discount if it is a, a, a direct seeming, like what we've been talking yeah. about. Yeah, well, I mean, like the last thing that you mentioned just sounds like an ordinary um, intuition, you know, what we call an intellectual intuition that it just seems like if there was a God, he wouldn't allow horrible things to happen. Um, right. we, you know, okay. But, uh, but I wouldn't call that a religious experience. But I think there are cases of um, things that are like religious experiences, except they're bad. <laughs> I think there are cases where people have this, a sense of just perceiving the meaninglessness of existence or something mm. like that, which is kind of like an anti-religious experience. And, um, you know, so then they have some reason for thinking that uh, existence is meaningless, you know, but there are defeaters for that, you know. <laughs> Uh, it's incompatible with other people's experiences, you know. Um. In the world of the philosophy of religion, you were talking about how an apologetic slant can uh, lead to people being misguided in, in their epistemology. I'm curious, maybe on a popular level or just people, day-to-day -day life, what are some common mistakes or miscon epistemological mistakes or misconceptions that you see just kind of in day-to-day -day things? Um, well, is this like mistakes about religion? That we, no, that it doesn't want? have to be specifically religious. It's just, I mean, maybe one could be just hyperbolic uses of the word no. Like if someone is cheering yeah. for their team and then they say they win like last minute and you say, I knew it. Well, yeah. I don't know if you knew it, you know, like things like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, my my sense of okay, I, I think a lot of people are um, you know, not very rational and not very good at forming beliefs. Most people are terrible belief formers or they're terrible thinkers. Okay, and like what are the most common errors that they make? Well, basically, um, two things assumption and dogmatism. Right? Which mm -hmm. is to say, you know, by assumption I mean people are like hair trigger belief formers. Like they they form a belief just, you know they think about the thing just the first thing that pops into their mind they believe that <laughs> whatever and you know like it might seem like i'm giving some comfort to that because i'm saying oh just start from the way things appear right but i also think that you should think hard you know <laughs> like okay you know maybe maybe the first thing that comes into your head is correct but think about it longer to see if you come up with any better ideas so right and you know as, you should you should ask yourself, how could this be wrong? You know, other people, if other people think something different, try to understand why they think a different thing, you know, and then, and the other problem that most people have is dogmatism, which is that they don't like to revise their belief. Right. And so when they encounter contrary evidence, uh, most people's initial reaction is to try to rationalize it, to try to come up with excuses for why they don't have to change their belief. Or, you know, just like add ad hoc stipulations to their beliefs in order to explain the evidence that, you know, was otherwise surprising. Yeah, so, and those are just like, it just seems to me extremely common, like almost everyone, unless you've had like a lot of philosophical training, almost everyone is like an automatic jumper to conclusions and, you know, rationalizer who just tries to maintain their existing beliefs. Do you do you think most people in general are usually irrational in, in in their beliefs? It seems like that's what you're suggesting. Oh well, I mean, it makes a big difference what kind of beliefs we're talking about. Mm, that's right? true. So their beliefs about yeah, like their beliefs about ordinary life are just going to be normal. You know, like they see a table, they're going to believe there's a table there, and you know, you ask them what time it is, they're going to tell you the correct answer, and so on. Yeah, but um, as as matters get increasingly theoretical and abstract, people's beliefs get increasingly um, off kilter, right? And, you know, 
they'll just get crazier and crazier beliefs. And how would seemings, um, how would, how would seemings play into say a high level debate about political philosophy or about, um, you know, the ethics of, of veganism, like uh, when, when seemings go beyond just perceptual observation and go into higher, like you said, theoretical discussions. Yeah, I mean, well, everything is still based on your appearances. It's just that you have different kinds of appearances, right? So, um, you know, like we, we have, um, when we're talking about normative questions, we have intuitions about right and wrong, okay? And that's the basis for all of our beliefs about what should or shouldn't be done. We have intuitions about something. So like, um, you know, you describe the case where this is like a famous example in the ethics literature, like there's a runaway trolley and it's headed for um, five people on the track who are going to be hit and killed, right? And then you can switch it onto another track where it will collide with and only kill one person. And so should you switch the trolley, right? And then, you know, like most people have an intuitive reaction that it's good to switch the trolley. It's something like that, All right? So, um, you know, so it's not the same kind of appearance. It's not a sensory appearance. It's an intellectual appearance. But mm -hmm. still, that's a reason for believing, you know, what appears to you to be the case, unless you have a reason for thinking otherwise. Um, but, you know, in, in political discussions, it's um, useful to keep in mind that there's a lot more variation in people's appearances. And therefore, we have reason to think that people are a lot less reliable than they are about just sensory observations. Right? Like it's way less common for people to disagree about sensory observations. You know, when I see the table, like almost everyone is going to see the same table and it's, and it's going to look the same shape and color, right? Or very close to the same, right? And uh, it's just like way more common to differ about political matters. So you should be a lot more careful in relying on your, um, your appearances in political matters, right? Hmm. I appreciate that. As the brief conclusion to each interview, I ask my guests three more, maybe more personal questions. The first is, what's something significant on which you've changed your mind? It could be in epistemology from studies, or it could be you changed your mind because of a conversation or an experience or, or anything like that. Um, I mean, like a long time ago, so when I first went to college, I was some kind of socialist, and I figured out that it was wrong. So that was an important mind change, although it was a long time ago. So it's not that not impressive. <laughs> um, uh, and, you know, like if that, if that was the only time I ever changed my mind, then it, it's going to sound like I'm dogmatic. Uh, you know, another thing was like around 2003, uh, I guess I supported the Iraq war, you know, because I thought that we actually I thought that they actually had weapons of mass destruction, like um, like George Bush was saying, but that turned out to be false. And, so, and it turned out that the war was something of a disaster. So, okay, so I, I changed my mind about that. Um, that, you know, to you, this is all ancient history, okay? <laughs> but, uh, okay, but to me, you know, that was like 10 years later, so that was significantly later. Um, hmm. Yeah, how about that? Yeah, I, I'm, if you brought it up, I'm curious, what's maybe one reason you thought socialism is wrong? Oh, um, well, so, so I read this, there's this, you know, Ayn Rand story. So in Atlas Shrugged, there's a particular kind of sub story that kind of explains, um, how, um, how a social society works. Right. So it's a story about, um, there's this, um, car company or something where they try to implement Marx's famous dictum from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. And so, um, and the story just describes what's going to happen that, you know, everybody wants to show that they have lower abilities so that less will be expected of them. And they want to try to multiply their needs or convince everyone else that they have greater needs so that they get more money or more stuff. And you can just see how this is a disaster, right? And then the people start resenting each other like, um, you know, every time somebody has a child, everyone, um, everyone else in the company resents them because that means that the rest of them have to support that child. Right. And you just see how the, how the system is just like, um, it's falling apart economically. And it's also like breeding, um, hostility between people and sort of destroying human relations. 
Hmm. That's interesting. Um, we were talking about that in one of my classes, and so I just wanted to, to clarify that with you. Uh, next, what's a more personal factor that influences your worldview? Something that doesn't necessarily constitute propositional evidence. Um, and I ask this for everyone, but in your case, I mean, it could, since we're talking about seemings, it could simply be, well, you know, your perceptual faculties or your power of introspection and stuff like that. But um, yeah, just more personal factors that influence your, your worldview. I don't know. I mean, well, my, I mean, my philosophical views just sort of completely match my personality. I mean, um, but, you know, but I don't, but I think that's just because I'm rational. Like my, so my personality is that I'm highly rational. Right. And, you know, like sometime a long time ago, it was like, you know, when I first started thinking about philosophy, when I was in college, I thought, you know, seems like it's more rational to just start from how things seem. I'm just going to suppose that things are the way they appear. And it took a while for me to formulate this, you know, clearly and explicitly in, in later work. But yeah, it's just sort of, um, um, it's my, my personality type to look for the most obvious account of something, right? And mm. You know, and that that might be just like being a normal person, okay? But that's distinctive among philosophers because there's so many philosophers who, um, you know, look for the most whatever, <laughs> look for convoluted, um, abstract, weird ideas. Yeah, that's right. the one of the books I read to prepare for the interview is your book, Knowledge, Reality, and Value: A Common Sense Guide to philosophy so you you value common yeah. sense yeah you could you could show it there um yeah okay everybody buy this yes. yeah no yeah I, I love that book and i'm i'm grateful to you for for writing it and for agreeing to invest time in, in this conversation so i want to thank you and i want to thank our audience hopefully you've been uh, educated and, and challenged so to everyone peace